Hi, everyone around this whole world. And thank you so much for helping me, Chocolate, Fluffy, and all of us to break through 171,000 subscribers this week. Onward to 175,000 by the June 20th summer solstice. And for that Earth File celebration, start thinking about questions you would like to ask me in recorded cell phone video that you can send Earth Files. By the middle of May, I'll let you know where to send your questions, recordings that we will use in the Earth Files Summer Solstice broadcast on Wednesday, June 23rd. The actual solstice is on the 20th. Now, sadly, animal mutilations persist in Oregon. Seven cattle in the last three months in Crook County, all with similar bloodless excisions. When I received this headline this morning, mysterious cattle, mutilations crop up again, this time with seven dead in central Oregon. I thought back a year and a half ago to September 2019, when this headline appeared. Cattle are being mutilated and killed in eastern Oregon, and no one is sure how or why. That's when the Sylvie's Valley Ranch, an hour north of Burns, Oregon, was hit with five purebred Hereford bull mutilations. Those five bulls were found with their tongues and genitals, quote, precisely removed without any blood, close quote. Other ranchers in the region said that they had similar bloodless, trackless cattle mutilations back in the 1980s. And in my second book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 1, Facts and Eyewitnesses, that was first released in 1993, 28 years ago, mutilations were in Oregon then too. In my book, I reported about this eerie Oregon case of a steer found October 1st, 1990, with a very strange bloodless excision on a ranch outside Portland in Multnomah County. This close-up shows the dry, serrated pattern that had also been reported on other mutilated animals going back to the mid-1970s. A local investigator, Carlos Posito, contacted me after they submitted the serrated steer tissue to veterinarian Madeline Ray at the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory College of Veterinary Medicine at Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon. Dr. Ray filed this formal report of laboratory examinations in which she wrote, quote, the notched edge does exhibit a band of coagulation necrosis consistent with a heat-induced incision, such as with an electrosurgical unit. It is not possible to tell whether this lesion was caused by a laser. It does appear consistent with a heat-induced injury." Close quote. Now here is an Oregon County map in which the Multnomah County steer with the bloodless serrated edge in October 1990 is at the top left, and the other six counties reporting mutilation since 2019 are in Wasco, Umatilla, Wheeler, Harney, Lake, and most recently more this week in Crook County at the center of Oregon. What is behind all the animal mutilations now and last year and going back every year to the 1960s? The answer is what Sheriff Tex Graves told me in Sterling, Colorado in September of 1979. Quote, Linda, the perpetrators of the bloodless, trackless animal mutilations are creatures from outer space. Close quote. Sheriff Graves his deputies, and many residents of Sterling, Colorado had seen UFOs like this glowing over pastures night after night from 1976 to 1977. Ranchers reported seeing beams of light emitted from the UFOs into their pastures. Some even saw an animal rise or another lowered in a beam. 
One mother and her daughter outside Houston, Texas in 1973, both watched a brown and white calf rising in a beam of light. And then they were abducted onto the craft where the mother, Judy Doherty, watched a gray being with large eyes and four long fingered hands use an instrument that thinly sliced the calf's testicles and other tissues. She felt the beings were looking for some dangerous ingredient in Earth's environment. But other human abductee eyewitnesses describe a different type of non-human, taller and reptilian looking, which say the reptilians telepathically to the abductees that they use blood and tissues from earth animals for sustenance and for genetic manipulation and experimentation. Even the head of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police investigation of dozens of horse and cattle and other animal mutilations in the 1970s told me honestly that he was convinced the bloodless, trackless mutilations were the work of, quote, entities in UFOs, close quote. But on TV, radio, and in newspapers, he and others always said they were looking for a satanic cult human perpetrators or a disease or natural predators that could leave such pristine bodies with the same patterns of excisions from body to body without any blood or tracks. Well, since 1979, I have reported the alien intelligence link to the worldwide animal mutilation phenomenon with hundreds of images and lab documents and interviews with veterinarians, pathologists, law enforcement, and eyewitnesses in my first two books, An Alien Harvest and Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 1, Facts and Eyewitnesses. I have also produced two documentaries, A Strange Harvest, followed a decade later by Strange Harvest 1993, when there was a huge UFO flap with dozens of animal mutilations in Alabama and the surrounding region of the southeastern United States and happening around the world at the same time. Today, if you do a search for animal mutilations at my Earth Files News website, the result is 680 reports since 20, uh, 1999 up to 2021. And they are kept in the real X-Files by subscription only to protect children and others from accidentally getting into the photos. But the photos are not gory. That's always been a mark of them. How pristine, no blood, and often no tracks around the animals which have always led the sheriffs and deputies to, as they say, look to the sky, that the animals were being taken and returned from the air. Lieutenant Colonel Philip J. Corso knew in the Pentagon, along with General Arthur Trudeau, in the 1950s to the 1960s, that extraterrestrial biological entities were responsible for the bloodless animal mutilations then and now. He writes about it in huge detail in his book, The Day After Roswell. And tonight, in part two of my interview with Army Lieutenant Colonel Corso about the discovery of lasers on crashed UFOs, the Colonel's own words from the historic book, The Day After Roswell, sum up the government secret knowledge to this day. And I am quoting Colonel Corso here about his and the Pentagon's discovery of thin black rod-shaped instruments that emitted glowing red beams and they were found on crashed UFOs. Colonel Corso, why did the inhabitants of this craft have a cutting device like this aboard their ship. It wasn't until later when I read military reports about cattle mutilations in which entire organs were removed without any visible trauma to the surrounding cell tissue that I realized that the light beam cutting torch was actually a surgical implement 
just like a scalpel that was being used by the aliens in medical experiments on our livestock. UFOs, ETs, and other intelligences were the subject of intense research in 1961 to 1963 in the Pentagon by General Arthur Trudeau, Chief of Research, and Lieutenant Colonel Philip J. Corso, who was then head of the Intelligence Research Division that was operated by General Trudeau. And their plan was to get UFO ET technologies and materials from a variety of UFO crashes in the 1940s on into the 50s and into the 60s and up to this day now, we know they've gone on. But back then, they wanted to get the, in, the research into research and development in American companies. And then General Trudeau said he wanted the companies to patent and preserve the alien technologies inside the United States for commercial applications, and then that would keep them out of the hands of international enemies. Last week, Colonel Corso said that finding the sophisticated integrated circuit in the UFO craft was their number one priority to back engineer as fast as possible. Number two on the Colonel's list of most important UFO technologies were lasers. That was at the beginning of the 1960s, and it took at least six decades from 1960 until one year ago in May of 2020 for one of the U Lowe's UFO ET technologies to finally evolve to real earth testing on May 16, 2020 near Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. And that was a direct energy weapon also known as a DEW weapon, D-E-W. The brief video here was released of the USS Portland LPD-27 shooting an unmanned drone out of the sky with a solid state directed energy laser. Carrie Sanders, commanding officer of the USS Portland said, quote, the solid state laser weapons system demonstrator is a unique capability the USS Portland gets to test and operate for the Navy while paving the way for future weapons systems. With this new advanced capability, we are redefining war at sea for the U.S. Navy, close quote, and I would add, thanks to Colonel Corso and General Arthur Trudeau, that at least 60 years ago in the Pentagon, they already knew about DEW do weapons that they were encountering in crashed UFO retrievals. One of the scientists that Colonel Corso references is front and center in this NASA photograph with Werner von Braun immediately behind him on the right. Hermann Obert was known as the German father of rocketry. He developed a V-2 rocket for the Nazis during World War II. And by 1955, Professor Obert moved to the United States to again team up with von Braun to develop rockets capable of reaching outer space for the U.S. Army. Their work led to the development of the Saturn V rocket that carried astronauts to the moon. Before Obert retired to West Germany in 1958, he was talking about time travel, a subject that Lieutenant Colonel Corso tried to include as a serious aspect of extraterrestrial beings and technologies when his book, The Day After Roswell, was released in July 1997. But the concept of time travel provoked media criticism. Ironically, today in 2021, a quarter century later, hypotheses about time travel through space-time portals are no longer taboo. And during our Dreamland interview hosted by Art Bell in Roswell on July 7, 1997, Colonel Corso suggested that one of the extraterrestrial technologies from General Trudeau's file cabinets 
that were among the first to be back engineered and applied in the Vietnam War were the black lenses that covered the ET eyes. During one of the Dreamland radio breaks that day, the Colonel suggested that we talk more about those black lenses. So tonight, I want to begin part two of the July 7th, 1997 interview in Roswell on the 50th anniversary of the July 1947 UFO crashes as we came back on the air with host Art Bell. Colonel Philip J. Corso retired as my guest along with William J. Burns and of course Linda Moulton Howe, all in Roswell, New Mexico. And Linda, I assume you're on the line? Yes, and during this break guard, I learned from the colonel that tomorrow he will be at Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque signing his books on that military base, a huge irony after these 50 years. And the Pentagon in Washington can't keep enough of the books in stock. That is a signal that this book is full of truth, that people that are at the inside today want this book. It's astounding. Linda, I want to read this to you and just see if it resonates. From Sean in Yucca Valley, I've heard from several people who work in high technology that the carrying capacity of fiber optics is so great that, get this, no future replacement for it is even being considered. Do you know if it's true? If it's the case, have you ever heard of another terrestrial-derived technology so robust that further development is deemed unnecessary? Well, I'm going to have the colonel try to address that after we had decided that what we would do next, because so many people want to know about the big black eyes, and everybody has seen the controversial Centilli film in which a surgeon lifts off a thin black lens off of being's eyes. I'm going to read to you briefly from Colonel Corso's own words. Quote, I was most interested in the file descriptions accompanying two dark elliptical eyepieces as thin as thin, and these are part of this file drawer kind of stuff. The Walter Reed pathologist said they appeared to be the lenses of the extraterrestrial creature's eyes and seemed to reflect existing light. The Walter Reed pathologists were the ones who did some of the initial autopsies on beings retrieved from New Mexico. Even in what looked like complete darkness, so as to illuminate and intensify images in the darkness to allow to pick out shapes, the report said that the pathologist at Walter Reed Hospital, who autopsied one of these creatures, tried himself to peer through them in the darkness to watch the one or two army sentries and medical orderlies walking down a corridor adjacent to the pathology lab. These figures were illuminated in a greenish-orange, depending upon how they moved, but the pathologists could see only their outer shape. And when they got close to each other, their shapes blended into a single form. But they could also see the outlines of furniture and the wall and objects on desktops. These eyepieces didn't turn night into day. They only highlighted the exterior shapes of things, unquote. Colonel, is the technology Linda just talked about what we now know as night vision? Yes, night vision. So there were actually those eye covers in the cabinet as well, and that's what led to night vision goggles. Yes. Remember, these creatures walked around in the dark. <laughs> How could they see in the dark if they didn't have something like that? One of the requirements when I went to the night vision lab is make a night vision device which can fit over the soldier's eye almost like goggles. Yes. General Trudeau called me one day and said, you go down with your inspection team and see how they're progressing. So I went to Fort Belvoir. The war is heating up in Vietnam. Give us a night viewing device in three to six months. They did. One of the other pieces in this amazing file cabinet that Colonel Corswell had, in the book... He said, why did the inhabitants of the craft have a cutting device that they could see that there was some kind of a red dot coming out of a black piece, one of these file cabinet technologies they did not understand. They didn't know what it was. Finally, one time that they saw some smoke in the room, and suddenly they could see this red beam of light, what we now know as a laser, Colonel Corsla said, why did the inhabitants of this craft have a cutting device like this aboard their ship? 
It wasn't until later when I read military reports of cattle mutilations in which entire organs were removed without any visible trauma to the surrounding cell tissue that I realized that the light beam cutting torch was actually a surgical implement, just like a scalpel that was being used by the aliens in medical experiments on our livestock, unquote. I would like now to turn the phone back to Colonel Corso. The second most important thing that I think we did was our development on lasers. The thing blossomed and took hold on lasers in 1960. Even General Beach, who took General Trudeau's place, made that remark in public. When you turned that device over? I turned them over to Monmouth, our electronic labs. We had to be very careful with that weapon. Actually, the weapon could go 300,000 kilometers a second. There was no lead time. They calculated it would travel one millimeter before the ray hit it. What weapon was this? Dual weapon. Direct energy weapon. Direct energy weapon. We had to be careful. It was dangerous. One doctor wrote an article that I have a copy of. He said the most frightening thing happened to me. My eyes popped out and started to bleed inside. He said, I never had such a frightening experience, and it came from looking at the ray. So we had to be careful with these things, too, because we didn't know what all it would do. So this was what later developed in the do weapon. And also we found out a very serious thing that during that period. The special projects officer of the anti-missile missile, he was a colonel, too. He came to me one day and he said, Phil, we got an awful thing. He said the Soviets can change its ICBM missiles victory in midair. Oh, my God, we better go to Trudeau right now. Mm-hmm. And that was a little frightening because if we couldn't hit him, look the danger we were in. That became a crash project. And the answer was really the do weapon. Direct energy weapon. Because it could get so fast, so quick on the target. That it wouldn't matter how it moved. Yeah, you couldn't have hit it. Like our radars, like the radars I had at Red Canyon here in, in White Sands on my Nike missiles, we had a pencil beam that could lock on. Colonel, was this some sort of electromagnetic pulsing weapon? It was a, it came from the laser family. At the end of your first exclusive interview you did with Dateline, yeah. you made a comment about a time machine. They seemed to use that comment of yours, rolled his eyes, as a way to almost try and discredit everything else you had said. So I've got to ask you about that. I discussed this with Professor Obert. We discussed time travel. And Obert thought himself, not me because I didn't know that much about it, Uh his opinion was that it is possible. That time travel is possible. Yes. That was Herman Obert. Colonel, earlier, I asked your co-author, Bill Burns, what kind of agony and thought process you went through before you came forward. It wasn't really agony. Let me explain why I decided to write the book. First thing, I had a note with the general. An honorable, honest, good man. I was an army officer. wasn't about to break my oath to him. Three years ago, unfortunately, he died. And he released my oath when he died. Then I could talk if I wanted to. And one day my grandchildren asked me, Granddad, what did you do in the war? I figured I'd better stop putting this on paper and at least leave them a legacy. No one has ever told me not to talk. But this is such incredible information that surely you must have at least considered the impact on society. Yes. Some of these things are earth-shaking. And it was the same as almost like combat. You have to live with it. How much of the material, Colonel, that was in those file cabinets was developed into products we use today percentage-wise versus how much we couldn't do anything with? I'd say that we've developed maybe less than 5%. So in other words, somewhere, there's still a lot of material that somebody's working very hard on. Exactly. A flying saucer was the capacitor. The extraterrestrial is really the guide system. The extraterrestrial blends with the capacitor. And we came to that conclusion... We were remiss that we didn't do more work to study this clone, this creature, or whatever he is. A retired colonel, Philip J. Corso, is telling us that the majority of the advanced technology that we have today didn't come from us. Back to Roswell. Linda? And Art, I am looking at page 115 in the book, The Day After Roswell, quoting Colonel Corso. 
among the Roswell artifacts from the Roswell crash were image intensifiers, which ultimately became night vision, fiber optics, which were fed into the phone system and a whole lot of other things, super tenacity fibers that were related somewhat to the way spider webs are so strong, lasers, molecular alignment metallic alloys, integrated circuits, micro-miniaturization of logic boards, portable atomic generators, ion propulsion drives, irradiated food, particle beams, Star Wars anti-missile energy weapons, electromagnetic propulsion systems, and depleted uranium projectiles. This is in a section of the book about some of the R&D development projects that he and General Trudeau were initiating and that have evolved to today. And there's one more thing before we go forward in time. We've been trying to understand the bismuth magnesium layered material that may have come from the bottom of a delta-shaped craft. Other people are trying to understand what other kind of pieces and particles they may have. One of the most extraordinary paragraphs in this book reads, quote, the initial revelations to the nature of the spacecraft and its pilot interface, there were hand-imprinted panels exactly as we have seen in the debris footage in the controversial Santilli videotape during the first few years of testing at Norton Air Force Base in California. The Air Force discovered that the entire vehicle functioned just like a giant capacitor. In other words, the craft itself stored the energy necessary to propagate the magnetic wave that elevated it, allowed it to achieve escape velocity from the Earth's gravity, and enabled it to achieve speeds of over 7,000 miles an hour, unquote. In other words, the outer portion of the craft might have been made of an anti-gravitic material much like bismuth magnesium. That's right. The pilots weren't affected by the tremendous G-forces that build up in the acceleration of conventional aircraft because to aliens inside it was as if gravity was being folded around the outside of the wave that enveloped the craft. It may have been like traveling inside the eye of a hurricane, but how did the pilots interface with the waveform they were generating? Colonel Corso says the pilots became part of the electrical storage and generation of the craft itself. They didn't just pilot or navigate the vehicle. They became part of the electrical circuitry of the vehicle, vectoring it in a way similar to the way you order a voluntary muscle to move. The vehicle was simply an extension of their own bodies because it was tied into their neurological systems in ways that even today we are just beginning to utilize, and the thing that they discovered in those tight-fitting suits is that the molecules of the fibers themselves were all oriented in the same way, and he speculated that when the hands are in the panels, the craft is lifted in a magnetic wave, and the fibers, all oriented, helped make the entire system generate as a whole system. Linda, we are working on exactly that technology. I've seen a number of specials on television about pilots literally thinking, not having to push buttons and pull levers and sticks and so forth and so on, but literally thinking commands. Right. Tonight, I hope everybody listening realizes that over the last 50 years, some of our major technological breakthroughs started in file cabinets in the Pentagon after they had been transferred from crash sites in the southwest of the United States through Wright-Patterson into areas of the Pentagon and other parts, probably Dreamland Area 51 in Nevada, and that today we are listening to a voice of a man who was there, who knows that this is the real thing. And what I'm intrigued also by is that General Trudeau, who when you begin to read some of the history about his life and his intellect, was an extraordinary man, a man who had an electrical engineering degree, who was perfect for understanding and relating to Colonel Corso. They knew the implications and how important it was to get it out into our country and not in the hands of enemies. And further, because there were animal mutilations, because there were human abductions, there, they had been monitoring since the end of the 50s. They felt it was so important to get a base 
on our own moon to monitor what we'll call extraterrestrial biological entity traffic coming in and out of our Earth and what might be on the moon, and that General Trudeau's Project Horizon was his answer to getting this done, and suddenly from left field comes a close down. And I'd like to go to William Burns now to try to help us understand what happened to close down this brilliant general and this brave colonel trying to get all of this going forward so that the Earth would not be so vulnerable. Here is William Burns. I want to go back to this whole concept of this war going on inside the Beltway. And obviously, nobody is going to say to General Trudeau, to Army R&D, well, look, fellas, I think you're too close to getting a beat on these ETs, so we got to shut you down because we're making a deal with them for the planet Earth. It's not what happened. In reality, what was being said, you've got three military services fighting for one military budget. How do you carve the pie up? If the Army is building rockets, the Navy is building rockets, so the Air Force is building rockets, they have three rockets, three development streams, three R&Ds. No, combine it into one. But you boys in the military can't stop fighting with each other. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to make a civilian agency that will be responsible to the Defense Department for funneling military missions into a civilian organized program. On the surface, that's good old-fashioned Americana. That's the way it's supposed to work. However, there was a much deeper and more sinister aspect to this. One, it wasn't all that clean to begin with, because who was the management of this? Intelligence agencies. This was being run in part out of the CIA. Well, how do we know this? Tell me one thing that you can show that the CIA was somehow involved in NASA to the point where it was utilizing NASA for its own purposes. Project Corona. Remember, as the colonel himself said on prime time, you had American surveillance overflights of the Soviet Union. We had no military satellites at that point. We're talking the late 50s. What did we have? NASA sending monkeys into space. The CIA went to Lockheed Skunk Works and said we're starting to get a bead on our surveillance overflight. The colonel himself said that one of the main reasons for U-2 flights was to draw Soviet surface-to-air missile fire to see when the missiles went hot and could they shoot down our planes. We sacrificed a lot of pilots. People said, oh, who is this guy saying this? Who is this guy, Corso? National Archives everything that Corso was saying was documented in black and white, and at the Eisenhower Library even today. So you've got a civilian space agency, NASA, which has superseded the military space missions. But who's running it? The CIA is in civilian missions, taking photos of the Soviet Union and showing they could do it. So we know the CIA was involved in NASA, even from the very beginnings. NASA was a way for the CIA to get control of the space program. The Civilian Space Agency was a pretext for the real advances that the military had already made in space missions. By the time with Project Corona in 1959, on the drawing boards was a full-blown military outpost on the moon. But it was a military outpost on the moon that wasn't just looking down on planet Earth, but out into orbital space, because we were not just monitoring Soviets, we were monitoring extraterrestrial traffic. And that's what the CIA was trying to keep from the American people. Privately, again, after the interview, Colonel Corso and I went on and talked for a very long time on many subjects. And I remember asking him, do you, Colonel, really think that the funding for the moon base uh, was actually canceled? If the CIA was the one that was really in control of a lot of things then, as they probably are now, Is it possible that the closing down 
of what General Trudeau so much had vested interest in getting a base on the moon for all of the right reasons. And it gets cut out from under him with the position he had in the Pentagon. Is it possible that it continued? And the colonel said that he told me he thought that General Trudeau was powerful enough in Washington that it probably was closed down. But today, as we sit here in April of 2021, I still wonder because when I was producing my Antarctica film and Spartan 1 and Spartan 2 both had firsthand knowledge about this base that has been underground on our moon, according to them, going back to at least the end of the 60s, perhaps before. Well, it's like a dovetail in the timeline that Colonel Corso was working with General Trudeau, 61 to 63, in the Pentagon. And General Trudeau thought that the moon base was going to be built with uh, some degree of uh, urgency going forward. And that would mean in the 60s there was a plan, and we know that we, uh, Neil Armstrong stepped onto the moon for the first time publicly. Was there a parallel other program that was going on, built the underground base on the moon that Spartan 1, Spartan 2, and a few others have talked about. How long have we been out in space, underground on the moon? And the persistence, I think, of whistleblowers telling me through the last five years, or going back to 2014 at least with that physicist that I've talked with you about before, there seems to be a kind of layer of knowledge information where you don't get tremendous volumes, but you do get confirmations. And one of those subjects that you get that kind of uh, confirmation because there are people who feel that even though they have been in non-disclosure activities, they f look at the headlines every day and what's happening on the planet and they uh, think and say to me, we should be all told the truth about the relationships of other intelligences in this Milky Way galaxy and beyond and this Earth. And the persistence of the we have a base on the moon. We've had a base on Mars underground for sure since 1972. That's always a line in the sand that is given to me. And it's all been kept secret. So I hope tonight that sharing this part two with you that comes from that long and fascinating discussion that Art and I did with Colonel Corso back in July 7, 1997, in the 50th anniversary of the Roswell crashes, and that I hope that you come away from what I have shared with you tonight with a, if that much came from UFOs and crashes and some kind of collaboration with ETs, and it's been going on for at least 60 years, why, why won't all of the governments level with all of the human family? What is it that keeps all of this until Colonel Corso did that interview? I don't think anybody had heard three hours worth of details. And today, we're waiting in that 180-day countdown. And already, there are rumors and pushbacks that the Secretary of Defense and the Director of National Intelligence still don't want to say anything about advanced aerial threats and linked to foreign adversaries of unknown origin. 
how much longer can this charade go on? And why? It's what gets me up in the morning. It's what makes me feel happy that you guys are coming to Wednesday nights. And I will transition now to dear Ian, who is in England and is so great with uh, interacting with the chat and questions. And Ian, I wonder what is on everybody's mind right now. Well, Linda, another great presentation, and it's uh, certainly gone down well with the audience this evening. Well, thank you. Uh, many, many good comments and uh, and uh, questions as well. But first of all, let's deal with the super chats uh, again. Another generous night with our audience, and thank I'm going you. to announce these in reverse order. We've got uh, Barry Marlow, James Armstrong, Caroline Boyce. Janovic Law Office, Sandra Johnson, Moon Baby, J Dark Files, J's Dark Files, sorry, Carl Bittner, Diamond Dave 247, Kendall 10090, Dawn Provenzano, MLD, Barber 0611, Jeffrey Wynn, Vidi K Blue, Eric Ackley, Vicky Martinez, Steve Nadamski, Ron Schooler, Gina McHugh, Moonbird, and Jeffrey Rizzo. <laughs> wow. I mean, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. What can I do? Just you keep uh, your enthusiasm helps keep me going every week to turn around these shows. So I want you to know it really matters to me that there is this much support and that it keeps growing. It means everything. It, it makes it possible for me to stay at that energy level to keep recycling every week. So thank you for keeping me in a good energy space. I really, really love you and, and thank you. Now, what else? Okay, it's always good when we have experiences sharing their experiences as well in the chat with the rest of us. We've got uh, one comment here from, uh, from a, a viewer who says, Yes, they have a plastic covering on their eyes. When I punched an alien in the face once on a craft, his eye cracked like it was made of plastic. And uh, wow. this one was, uh, this viewer was also interviewed by Art Bell. Oh, Ian, could you ask him if he could uh, email to me at Earth Files uh, a phone number where I could follow up by phone? Is that possible? Bye. I have done already, and, uh, and they've told us that uh, they will be in touch, so that's Great. good. Well, that is fascinating, and I do not think that that's improbable. But here's the, the thing. We've just gone through all of this about through the eyes of the Pentagon and how advanced the ET technology is. Why would they have a, uh, the Colonel and General Trudeau uh, described the skin thin lens you pick up. And in that photo that I had from the Santilli film, that was part of what I was trying to get across too, that uh, I think those are very legitimate autopsy images. And the black covering is on the eye on the photo on the left. And then on the right, the eye is free of it. and. I have also had a discussion with a man who was the son of a surgeon who worked at Wright-Patterson, and his father was in on uh, one of the autopsies of extraterrestrial biological entities. And that is where they discovered that when there were two surgeons and there the father was monitoring and making notes of everything that happened. And I believe, if I recall, that the date was in 47 or 1948, and that the body that had been shipped quickly to Wright-Patterson was a form of gray. And the two surgeons talking to each other, the father, who the son came to me, is taking notes of what the surgeons are saying 
in an ongoing discussion as they begin of what to do with this alien body. And one of the observations was that the black on the eye was a really thin, but I had the impression that it was malleable, that it was something that just went right over the large eyeball. And plastic, I do have illustrations. I really do have illustrations that people have done who were on UFO retrievals back in the 50s, I think. And some of them had drawn the black as like what a plastic shield would look like. But going back into what I think are 1940s real, real information, you get the description that it can be lifted off like a layer on the eye. If anybody listening has any information about the difference between a hard plastic black covering and a malleable skin-like <clears throat> lens that would fit on the eye. I would love to know if anybody out there has any information and you can get a hold of me either straightforwardly through earthfiles at earthfiles.com or through Proton Mail or uh, writing a letter to my post office box 21843 Albuquerque, New Mexico 87154. Um, and then there's FedEx if something is really sensitive. So let's see if we can learn more information. But one thing I think is really clear after 70 years from the first reports, we're dealing with artificial intelligence made by real organic beings that interact together and that some have maybe firmer more robotic eyes, others maybe are more organic, and that it has always been such a mixture and confusion from the beginning. And today, finally, in 2021, we are beginning to understand that the grays are a huge menagerie of everything from different sizes of artificial intelligence that interact with taller, independent, apparently organic, but even that is not firm, beings that are in control. And so who was autopsied in all of these cases? Which type? And that goes to one last thing. When the son was talking to me about what the father came home and told the family, he's the one taking the notes. When they brought up the scalpel, and had decided that they were going to do a Y or T cut to come into the alien body. And the surgeon who came down with a scalpel, it stopped. And the note taker said, the surgeon said, this isn't skin. This is something like fabric. And they couldn't get through the fabric with the scalpel. And that, as far as I know, is was a true event that happened at the end of the 40s. And it must, it must have sent the people in the war office in the mid-40s and later in the beginning Department of Defense and the Pentagon as they evolved from the war office into the Department of Defense. When they got reports like that from surgeons, they must have gone like, they don't even have skin. Well they were probably dealing with one of the AI. So, all right, Ian, let's evolve onward. Okay, Linda, apart from the crash in Missouri in uh, 1941 and the rumored crashes in Italy and in Germany in the 30s or early 40s, uh, why have so many craft crashed in New Mexico and the surrounding area. I think a few were referenced by Colonel Corso as well as being um, below the border as well in Mexico. There are two uh, pieces that come into my mind immediately. 
One, in uh, White Sands, after the war, uh, Project Paperclip bringing over all the German scientists, uh, they were dealing with UFOs that were interacting and sometimes interfering with uh, their rocket launches. And they were, uh, they wanted to find a way to both monitor and possibly, I suppose, military term, try to take these silver discs down. And Stanton Friedman and I talked about this in depth once, about the hypothesis that they were experimenting with really intense microwaves, all the way from White Sands all the way up to Moriarty, uh, up further north, there was experiments with microwave. And it may be that Stanton had done enough research to hypothesize that the microwave research could have been interfering with those craft. The other category answer that's quite different. I've been told probably two or three times by people who were serving in the military at various times that they had been in discussions about the UFO ET phenomenon being like Trojan horses that whatever they were, the crashes might have been planned. And if they were all AI that were operating the craft that did crash, and they were not the progenitor, original organic ones, then it is possible that the advanced beings deciding that they wanted to get into human hands certain technologies that would evolve us faster toward this path, this path, this path, that what was contained in some of those crashes could have been as calculated as a chess move. And I remember that there was one person who was talking to me about what they had found in some of the craft and that they too were confused sometimes about the juxtaposition of certain pieces or certain technology and that maybe a year or two later, one man said, we really went after one thing and we came to a dead end. And you know what we figured? That these beings had an agenda and they wanted us to go down a red herring path. And we used a year or two going down the red herring path before we realized it didn't work. And then the only answer we could come to was they diverted us. But well, why did they divert us? Okay, so I've laid out a kind of bell-shaped curve of uh, possibility of uh, harvesting real viable technology uh, from real craft that may have been brought down by uh, experimental microwave to that we're dealing with extremely advanced intelligences that use lots of artificial intelligence and that they are uh, trying to be a thousand steps ahead of us at all times. And that we humans might evolve faster. We might get stronger if we would be told the whole story. And then the whole planet would be in on all of these questions and confusions. But until that time, uh, it is fun to have these dialogues with you. I just wish we could prove and have confirmation that was firm. Let's see. How about one more question? Linda, this refers back to last week's show. Uh, you featured a photograph taken, apparently a representation or a photograph taken by a pilot with a cell phone. We've had several comments from people saying that this 
picture may not be the original picture. Can you comment on that, please? Yes. Um, I believe it was the debrief who had uh, headlines about getting official uh, spokesman, Sue Goff, in the Pentagon, a spokesperson, confirming that the green triangle and the video were uh, actually had come from pilots. Remember that? And along with that uh, video that I had loop over and over and over again so we could watch it, I ended up with a paragraph saying that also what was released was allegedly from an F-18 of a pilot using his cell phone of a triangle with uh, white circles in the three corners, which have been reported around the world for decades. And I personally thought that the image that was purported to be a representation of the F-18 cell phone photo I thought it looked too neat or too, the, there was no sh shading. It was like, but I was uh, in the position as sometimes as a journalist, a professional journalist, I keep up and try to share with you what I think is the most important, strongest, uh, most solid information as it evolves. And I thought that it was significant that uh, Sue Goff, in the Pentagon would have allowed her name and would have supported the video in that same story. Whether it was contrived, whatever it was, was that a photo through the, uh, the glass of the F-18. So when I am doing a story where I am trying to get all sources, as much information as possible, always wanting to give the strongest details on origin. That is the one thing that I'm sure you all feel as frustrated as I do, that even if there is a photograph that was described, it may not be the one that is released in the so-called original release in the media for reasons that are not clear. But I was not an arbiter, and I certainly would have no way of separating the wheat from the chaff about what is the, you, I'd have to have the original frame or video, we'd have to have metadata analysis, we'd have to interview the pilot. Yes, that's what everybody should be doing. But in that case, the big box of the story was that a spokesperson, Sue Goff, in the Pentagon was saying that the video that contained that green triangle was actually recorded by pilots. Now why that other image through the F-18 window of a different type, the three white, was included in that article looking not like a photo, but looking like an illustration, I don't know. But I can guarantee you, with a big digital hug, that I'm trying every single day to get as many facts as I possibly can to report to you, and that we are at an extremely difficult time when people in the Pentagon, some of them are pushing against revealing anything at the end of the 180 days. And there are other forces that you hear. They feel that we should be given a lot at the end of the 180 days because it came from Congress. And Congress has asked the Secretary of Defense and the Director of National Intelligence to report about advanced aerial threats and possibly linked foreign adversaries. And if by the 1st of July, we have not had something substantive 
from either of those people or those offices about those subjects requested in legislation, what would it mean? I'd love your thoughts. I'd love your insights, especially for those of you who might be working in, under NDAs, who know a lot more and who might have insights about why would there be even any pushback right now about telling the truth on what was requested in that COVID funding bill? And what is the advanced aerial threat? And who are the advanced alien allies of this planet and humans? I think that that is a reality. And we need to be told the truth about it all. And on that note, I truly love you guys. Thank you. Let's keep going for 175 for the summer equinox. And I will make those announcements uh, as we get into the early part of May about how we want to have all of our dialogues together for that show and have fun. And thank you for being here tonight. And I look forward to seeing you next Wednesday in this ongoing dialogue with so many of you now from around the world. It, it just warms my heart. People aren't closing down. They are opening up and they want the truth. Thank you. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white settings button next to the CC button. Select subtitle CC and then select auto translate. I don't have to put them in select the language or, uh, bind them anywhere they love and the captions will now appear in that language sort of gone through and they will hold their heads I never had a cat do that before and they'll pull against the comb helping me get out snarls and I think it's the best they've ever been <laughs>